Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is... Robert of Gloucester. Being the oldest son of a king is almost a gift, especially in the 12th century. You'll be well cared for, educated, and you'd have a place in society. Our next subject would want for nothing except legitimacy. Robert of Gloucester was the oldest son of Henry I, but he wasn't born to Henry's wife, Edith Matilda. He was born to an unknown, but speculated on, woman. He was one of Henry's many, many, many illegitimate children. He was born in 1090, 10 years before his father would become king. His name is surprising if we remember the antipathy between Henry and his brother, Robert Curthose. It is likely that Robert of Gloucester was born during a brief positive point in their relationship. Robert, sadly, does not have a modern biography. He's featured in those of his father, sister, and cousin, but no one has written one for him yet. Thankfully, he is featured in primary sources and occasionally historical analysis. Henry I was not unique in his predilection for having bastard children, but he was in his willingness to claim them. There are countless children throughout history who were rejected by their fathers because their mother was not his wife. Henry was not one to do that. He did seem to have regular mistresses, but unlike many kings, they did not seem to have a say in his politics. He kept that place for his legal wife. He did, however, make sure that the children he claimed were cared for. The boys were raised to be knights, given estates, and had very beneficial marriages arranged for them. These were usually beneficial to Henry as well. His daughters were raised to be ladies, and they were married equally well. One was even the wife of a king. Those of either sex that weren't married were sent to the church, in roles expected for one of royal birth. He did not just ignore his children. Henry seems to have expected just as much from these children as he did from his legitimate children. The only difference was they would never rule, or at least that was the plan. In 1119, Henry arranged for Robert to marry Mabel Fitzrobert. She was a wealthy heiress, about 10 years younger than him. She gave him, and he would control her estates as her husband, the honors of Gloucester in England, Glam Morgan in Wales, San Scolas, Sir Sart, Eversey, and Crowley in Normandy. An honor is a large barony consisting of at least 20 knights fees. This is the amount of land required to supply and equip 20 knights for one season. Remember, this includes funding for horses, both war and draft, the knights and his family's lodgings, food, and clothing, plus their requisite servants. It also includes the payment for those who work the land, either farms or mines, the knights' armor and weapons. It's a huge amount of land and money to control. Having at least 100 knights in his service made Robert very powerful. His role as his father's general and future military leader for his brother was obvious. Henry wanted his legitimate son, William Adelin, to have the best support possible. And Robert, as we've seen in Matilda's episodes, was a great choice. As I've discussed multiple times, in the 1120s, the Anglo-Norman world was rocked to its core. The white ship disaster was horrible for the realm. Losing a future king is horrible, but many families were touched by it. The ship had been full of young adults of the aristocracy. Robert lost another brother and sister in addition to William Adelin. Robert avoided being on the ship because he was an adult. Those who liked to go to bed at a more reasonable time were on Henry's ship, ahead of the white ship. It's probably a better excuse than Stephen had. After the sinking, in 1121 or 22, Robert was elevated to the Earldom of Gloucester. This gave him control of at least three castles, Canterbury, Bristol, and Gloucester, though the latter was eventually watched by Miles of Gloucester, no relation, Earl of Hereford. He was loyal to Robert and would join Matilda's side in 1139. These castles and territories also increased the number of knights he had in his service to at least 200. That was a powerful number of fighting men to be in control of. Henry choosing to elevate Robert when he did his telling. It's one year or so after the death of William Adeline. It would have appeared to many outside observers as though Henry was considering naming his natural son his heir. In Normandy, this would have been normal. Of the seven Dukes of Normandy, or Counts of Rouen, as they were first known, only two had been born after their parents' legal church-sanctioned marriage. They were brothers. (laughs) In two cases, their parents were married more Danico, literally the Danish manner, 
a marriage not seen as official in the church, but recognized in the community. Sometimes this marriage couldn't be recognized in the church because one party was already married. This type of marriage will come up a few more times, and in later episodes, I'll provide even more detail. One case, the Duke's parents were married after his birth, and he was legitimized at that point. And finally, there's William, the man who was called the bastard until he became the conqueror. I'm sure no one ever said that to his face. There were a few things, though, that would have stopped Henry from naming Robert as his heir. The first is usually mentioned to be the church, but I'm going to make a minor argument against that. In most modern references to Robert, a reader will find a short statement along the lines of, quote, William had been a bastard and that hadn't stopped him from ruling England, but the church had moved on from his time and changes prevented Robert from being in consideration, end quote. While it was true that the church preferred legitimate issues, I can find evidence of at least one European king, Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile, declaring his natural son, Sancho Alfonso's, his heir. While Sancho never became king, his death before the age of 20 precipitated his father's passing. There was no indication that the church objected in any way. Had Sancho lived, Henry might have been able to use his ascension as precedent to appoint Robert. I do think the church would have protested, but I think Henry would have been able to win them over, or to tell them to shut up, if he had wanted to. The second is more interesting than old men in fancy robes, and I think it's a more compelling reason that more historians should examine. The Anglo-Saxon populace would not have stood for it. While they had been subjugated, they still outnumbered their Norman overlords by at least 10 to 1. Dating back to the time of Offa of Mercia between 757 and 796 and the Council of Chelsea in 787, the only people allowed the title of Ethling, or princes eligible to be elected as king, were legitimate sons of past kings. The Witan would have the final say of which of these would be given the kingship, hence why Alfred the Great became king over his nephew, Ethelwald. The Witan could have chosen either, but Ethelwald was the child and Alfred was a proven warrior. However, Ethelwald was still eligible for the kingship after Alfred's death. Lucky for us, but sadly for him, Edward the Elder stepped in. Avoiding an Anglo-Saxon uprising would be something Henry would have thought about. It's likely that they would not accept an illegitimate son as king. They were more likely to accept a woman. It was a bit more than 50 years since the events of 1066. Long enough to still remember what had happened and still want revenge, plus plenty of time to rebuild their population of fighting age men. I find not wanting to deal with this even more reasonable than worrying about what the church would say. The final reason is probably the one that convinced Henry the most, and is most important. Robert didn't want to be king, not even a little. Every source states that whenever it was put to him, he would reject it. Based on his actions after Henry's death, his lukewarm acceptance of Stephen, his willingness to attach himself to Matilda the moment she needed him, Robert was very honest with what he wanted. Based on all my reading, I think Robert was in possession of something most people lacked, self-awareness. He knew he would only be an okay king. He lacked the drive to be king, but he knew how to lead men well in war. This becomes more apparent through his actions after his father's death and during Stephen's rule. If Stephen had possessed this level of self-awareness, the anarchy could have been avoided. Even though Robert knew he wouldn't make a great king, plenty were ready to suggest him. He would have had more support than Stephen, but it really wasn't the role he wanted. He was happy to have sworn an oath to support his sister. His disagreement with Stephen as to who would swear first shows Robert's loyalty and Stephen's duplicity in a nice little package. After publicly declaring for Matilda in 1138, persuaded that Geoffrey of Anjou would take care of her continental interests, he was her most loyal general. His forces captured Stephen at the Battle of Lincoln. Had he not been captured in September 1141, it's likely he would have been able to retake London and have Matilda crowned. Robert was released in December of the same year. There isn't much published about Robert's time in captivity. He was probably not treated poorly. His death would have stopped any discussion for a trade of Stephen. 
He was able to sail back and forth across the channel and continue fighting, and there aren't reports of him suffering from similar emotional issues that Stephen understandably was plagued by. Robert continued to support Matilda through this all. He would make no trade that would put her at risk or force him to abandon her. After his release, he would go on to train his young nephew during one of Henry's many visits to England. In 1145, he would have to deal with a small bit of rebellion of his own. Philip, one of Robert's five legitimate sons, defected to Stephen. He was 15 and possibly just going through a teenage rebellion. While it would have hurt Robert to have his son defect, it likely didn't cause any real trouble, at least at first. In the summer of 1146, Reginald, Earl of Cornwall, and half-brother to both Matilda and Robert, was leading a delegation to conduct peace negotiations on Matilda's behalf. He had been granted safe conduct by Stephen, so when he was kidnapped by his nephew, it was probably a bit of a surprise. Stephen was understandably enraged. He was a truly honorable man, and this was not honorable. Stephen demanded that the young man release their family member. Remember, Reginald is also Stephen's cousin. I can't find further references to Philip, but I imagine Stephen did not trust him with anything important after that. Philip sadly only survives his father by one year. In 1147, Robert declined to send Henry Fitz Empress funds when he found himself trapped in England, as I discussed in Matilda's episode. Just like Matilda, I think he was making sure his nephew learned the value of planning and preparation in military operations. Henry should have been grateful to receive this lesson, and it may have been the last his uncle could give him. In October 1147, Robert fell ill. He was supported by his wife and some of his children. I doubt Philip was invited. He died on the 31st. He was only 57, but had fought hard for much of his adult life. He was survived by his six children with Mabel and at least one of his illegitimate children. He sadly didn't live long enough to see the result of all his efforts. The crowning of his nephew seven years later and the vast Angevin empire he would rule would have shown it was all worth it. He was buried in St. James Priory, which he had founded. My analysis of Robert is less about how the world would have been if he had been king, and more about how he chose to live his life. I find a lot of valuable lessons from learning about him. Robert's self-awareness is something we should all strive for. To know when you've reached the limit of your abilities and to be happy there is a great skill. Stephen was a horrible king. Had he not been dealing with a civil war, he would have been the lower end of middling at best. He thought much better of his skills than evidence would show he had. Maybe his wife Matilde persuaded him to go for it. Maybe he thought his son would make a great king, but he made the wrong choice. Robert, on the other hand, may have had the role suggested to him by his father. Henry didn't often take no for an answer. So Robert must have been very convincing to put it out of Henry's mind so decidedly. There is no evidence that Henry ever asked Robert, but the timing of his ennoblement could be indicative of this line of thinking. Robert knew when to say he had reached his highest height. Robert's ability to support someone whom the world saw as inferior ruling is the second part. There are others who did this, of course. Brian Fitzcount, Geoffrey of Anshu. But Robert was the big one. Matilda needed him if she were to have any chance. It would likely have been easier to just go along with Stephen. Just retire to Bristol. Go fight when needed, but stay out of court. Robert knew this wasn't what he wanted. He wanted a life with purpose. Not the purpose of being king, but something of value and meaning. Dr. Catherine Hanley put this beautifully in her book, Matilda, Empress, Queen, Warrior. Quote, what we really need to do is turn the accepted narrative on its head and recognize that it was he who is indebted to her for giving him the opportunity to make more of his life than he might otherwise have done, end quote. Robert could easily chosen the comfortable life, faded into the background, and let Stephen have his way. He would be remembered as one of Henry's many bastards and a great general for his father, but that's it. Instead, he's remembered as one of the most loyal and able men history has ever created, and a man worthy of his title and place in history. For this episode, I again used Matilda, Empress Queen Warrior, as a secondary source. I also used Henry I by C. Warren Hollister. It was a great source for explaining why Robert was not eligible for the kingship. 
One thing I hope to do with this podcast is to inspire listeners to look into some of the more obscure but interesting people in history. I want to share their stories, but I would love to read more. Robert of Gloucester is one of those characters in need of a biography. He is a supporting character in so many other people's stories, and he really needs his own fully told. I don't have access to a full university library or the archives that would be needed to do Robert justice. If I'm going to put out an episode each week, I can't be flying to the UK for research. Plus, my husband and kids would miss me. If I've inspired anyone to research more about any subject, I would love to hear from you. I'm happy to share your research, update my episode, or completely retract anything I've said that's incorrect. Please feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.